Um, well, I thought what we'd do firstly is just a few housekeeping things. Um, uh, myself and Mary get quite a few emails uh, during any week, and uh, I personally find it very, very hard to reply to them. So lately, I haven't been replying to any. So those of you who have sent me um, an email expecting a reply, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to reply. But there's a lot going on in my life too, and I spend very, very little time now sitting in front of the computer, which is fantastic. <laughs> because uh, for 20 years I was a computer consultant, so um, it's such a relief to not spend any time in front of the computer. But I would, uh, I just wanted to say to you that I do read your emails, and the reason why I can't reply is that there's just so many of them that it's impossible for me to reply to your emails. So hopefully what we'll try to do, if you, if you, when you email me, if you do have questions, and if you can word them in such a way that we can incorporate them into the sessions that we do. And that way a lot of your questions will get answered. And not only will they get answered for you, but also for everyone else as well. You're a long way away from me, aren't you? So. <laughs> <laughs> Bad thing, is it? Thank you for that, Jen. It's going to be handy. Yeah. So. I decided to keep it, Jen, if it's okay, in case I get really embarrassed and I need to hide behind it. I'm still working through issues around sexual shame. <laughs> Red's the appropriate colour, actually. <laughs> Mark, you want to come back? Most of, us, most of us, when it comes to a discussion about sex, uh, particularly if we're choosing to talk about it with our children, probably go into a sense of embarrassment at some point. Or uh, if we choose to talk about it with others, usually it has to be someone who's really, really close to us, who we're very unafraid of, and know that they are very non-judgmental before we'll actually talk openly about the subject. Today what we wanted to do, though, is present the material in a way that firstly, um, we want to present God's viewpoint about sex. And then the next, the next session we do about sex, which will be not, not tomorrow, tomorrow will be a question and answer session about sex, and then uh, I think it's in April, uh, about... 25th. No, it's the week before. April the 18th here at Udlow. Uh, we'll be doing the part two of this discussion. The, this, part, this part will be um, basically focusing on God's viewpoint of sex and trying to bring ourselves in line with that viewpoint. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the next part will be looking at how we go about working through all of our sexual injuries, uh, of which uh, usually the majority of us have quite a lot of them because of the terrible projections that we've got from family and so forth right from a very young age, notwithstanding the big issues with regard to sexual abuse and and multi-generational issues regarding how women in particular have been treated with sex and how men have been demanding with sex and so forth. So there's all these different areas that we'd like to cover and today we want to just focus primarily on the issue of how God views sex. And tomorrow's a question and answer and uh, it'd be really good if people can come up and ask their questions since uh, um, everyone, like we'll try and be really open as well. But if not, um, if you want to write down questions and uh, leave them up the front or somewhere we could designate in the break, then we could try and address questions that way as well if you're feeling a bit embarrassed. Also, if there's questions during the session, what we'll try to do is first present some material and then what we'll do is at the end of each section, we'll give you the opportunity to ask questions about that material and then we'll, we'll do, go on to the next section. So that's probably how we'll handle today. Sound all right? Okay. That's good. Uh, is, is the radio microphones, you've got one, Tris? And it works without ringing. Turn it on for us and talk with it. Uh, it's channel two. There we go. And maybe if we just want to designate a place where people can leave their questions, if just up the front. Maybe. Up on top of the cabinet there if you've got questions that you don't want to ask in public. So leave your name off of it if you're going to do that. <laughs> we'll just read it out and go, oh, Susan would like to. 
and then we'll say stand up, Susan. <laughs> We'll get, and we'll get uh, Fraser to pan around <laughs> so the world can see what you choose. <laughs> no, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but, but there's no reason why this subject can't be treated in exactly the same way as every other subject that we've had to, to be treated. And so one thing I'd like to encourage you to do is be really open with your questions and, uh, and really honest with how you feel too. So today what will be happening a bit is that you will feel, some of you will feel a sense of judgment. And so what I would like to encourage you to do, if that's the case, is to really own those feelings, because I, I don't, I'm not judging you with regard to your sexual life. What I'm just going to be presenting today, and what Mary's going to be presenting today, is just this, uh, this presentation is surrounding what God's viewpoints are. And remember too that God doesn't judge you either. So if you have different viewpoints, then that's up to you. And if you want to practice those things, that's up to you too. But what we want to do is be very truthful with you about these things and where they come from. So that's a really important part of this discussion. So if you find yourself getting angry, it would be really good if you just put up your hand and say, look, I'm really angry about what you just said. And just say what you feel. Do you know what I mean? And voice, that, voice those feelings. And we'll talk about the underlying emotion. It's far better to do that than just to hold on to your feelings and suppress them. So if you can avoid doing that today, that'd be great. Now, um, on the natural love path, you'll be tempted to hear this information and then put it into practice without dealing with underlying emotions. So you'll be tempted to try to think differently or to try to act differently, but you'll find that unless you deal with the under underlying emotions regarding sexuality, there will be no real changes in your life at all. And the reason why is sexuality is such a core part of your soul that unless you actually change things at the soul level, it's going to be very, very difficult for your life to change. So if you can bear that in mind, changing this is about changing things at the soul level rather than the intellectual level. Someone ask me a question? Uh, just wait for the mic if you can. If you just um, act and think differently, are you dealing with the emotions anyway? Um, not always, no. Because it's like, for example, let's say you had some sexual shame inside of yourself. Now, sexual shame might dictate that you're not open during, during the sexual act. So if you just force yourself into being open, the changes itself, the change won't actually happen inside of you. And sex is very much connected with your emotions. And that's one of the things we want to present today. It's so connected with your emotions that unless you change at the emotional level, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to force yourself into change. How do you change at the emotional level? Well, that's what we'll be, that's what we'll be looking at in part two. So today we'll be looking at God, God's, you know, what God has created in terms of sex. And in part two, we'll be looking at how you actually go about changing how you feel emotionally about it. But the basic principles of emotional processing still apply. So you, you want to feel the emotion that's being triggered. Feel it to the causal. All right, so um, we just want to do some reminders about the soul. And I'll draw. I can draw. I've always wanted to draw this doll. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want Sorry. Oh, remember that God, so if you draw God, is a soul. And then God, God created all these little souls, of which we are a half. Ah, we're a half of these little souls. And then these little souls incarnate and separate due the process of incarnation, separate into two different forms. Do you remember that? <laughs> Is she doing a good job? Which one is All right, now these these souls, these half of the souls, are now connected to bodies, the material body and the spiritual body. Does that make sense? So, where does sex happen? 
Sex happens at the soul level. So this is very important to understand. For the majority of people on earth today, sex is just happening at the physical level. For some people on earth today, sex is happening at the physical and spiritual level, but there's very few people on earth where sex is actually happening in its pure form at the soul level. Do you understand that? And the reason why is because we've shut down our soul so much that we don't finish up using our soul to be the expression. We actually use our body to be the expression, including of sexuality. So, oh, nice girls. <laughs> they got no tops on though. <laughs> and so at the soul level, what's actually happening is we want to have sex at this level. In other words, with one half of the soul with the other half of the soul. That's where God intended us to have our sexual expression. For the majority of people on earth, what we're doing is having it at the material body level. Right? We're having it just our body with somebody else's body. And because there's not huge connections with regard to the soul, and we'll talk about why later, the, the, the result, sex isn't exactly what God intended it to be. So what we want to do is talk about what God intended it to be in a minute. Now, what is the soul? Can you tell me what the soul was again? It's our emotions, passions, desires, memories, intentions, personality, aspirations. Mention memories. Sorry? Free will, so it's got free will. Okay, so that's our soul. So remember, that's the level that we want to have this discussion about sex, at that level. It's actually that level that God created sex to be its most powerful. At the physical level, it's actually the least powerful. So if you think you're having fun now, just wait till you get connected at the soul. Then you really have some fun. Jen, would you like to ask a question? Is it possible to have sex without experience just a very small part of the soul in the sexual act if yes. you're somebody that is you know you're very connected with yes you, know, you can sort of float in and out of it so to speak yes and this is what happens for the majority of us actually is that we're floating in and out of a pure connection and then back into a physical connection because of the different emotional blockages that have occurred inside of us does that make sense? So, so a lot of times we are actually connecting at a soul level, but it's only for moments in time. It's not all the time. And in fact, in the end, what we'll see is that God actually created us where we have our sexual expression 100% of the time. So all the time you would be in a sexual, you would have a sexual expression relationship with your soul mate, is what God intended. Which is a very... You like that idea? You like that idea, right? Brings up a few emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And we'll talk more about that as, as we go on today. All right. You want to say something about it? Well, I just like your definition of sexuality. It's actually soulality. Yeah. So, so can you see that we're not really talking about sexuality. We're talking about soulality or the connection that occurs at the soul level. Does that make sense? So it's like, yeah, because of course we're all attached, as he tells us all the time, if you can harness the power of your soul in the sex act, then it obviously becomes far more beautiful, more powerful, rather than just acting on those two. Yeah. And in fact, uh, if we look at it from God's perspective, God created you through a sex act. Like, so you, God actually ha had sex to create you, you could say. And all of us are therefore creations of God's, of God's desire to engage in sexual expression. And procreation is one of the results of sexual expression. It's not the only result, but it's one of the results of sexual expression. So the whole, I, the whole thing that we exist in the first place is a result of a sexual expression of God. And if you start looking around at yourself at the universe, almost every living thing you can think of has some kind of sexual expression, doesn't it? Plants, 
birds, animals, even very, very small living creatures, all have some kind of sexual expression. Very few of them are hermaphrodites, in other words, having sex with themselves to procreate. Almost all of God's creations are actually involving more than one entity in order to create. Usually two, of course. Which is part of God's way of teaching us about what sex is about, too. All right, so God loves sex. Do you? <laughs> so, can you say something about is is God's expression then hermaphroditic, or how does how does God have sex? You remember that God has masculine and feminine qualities, and if you can think of it like this, at the moment you are a half of a soul. And when you have sex, you have sex with the other half of the soul. Whether it's your soulmate or not, you're, you're engaging in sexual interaction with another half of your soul, of, of a soul. Now, the two of you are sort of like a part, aren't you? Now, if you could think of God's soul as those two halves together constantly as one, then basically you start understanding what sex is for God. Does that make sense? And you will actually be in that state in the 22nd sphere, in the spirit world. In the state where you're actually having sex constantly because you are now joined with your soulmate. And so God's constantly having sex. If you could think of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want the fan, Jen? <laughs> Do you feel a bit embarrassed now, Jen? No, I don't know. I don't know. Fire away, what would you like to ask? And there's a mic coming up. What's the giggle? Tell us that. Tony just said to me, well, how does he get anything else done? <laughs> <laughs> that, and this is the thing. Sex is always creative. So you get lots and lots of things done when you're having sex all the time. <laughs> That's why I'm not answering it. <laughs> oh, I was embarrassed with that one too. to sexuality we often connect with that particularly guys <laughs> connect with the idea of having sex constantly right but um, to actually get to that place at a soul level rather than a physical level takes dealing with a lot of emotions and that's something that we'll talk about today in more detail without dealing with the emotion um, all we're doing is really engaging in a physical act rather than actually a soul act and a lot of times today, our desire for sex is often um, based around injuries. And we'll, come, we'll look at that, how that's based around injuries many times. And, and how we can actually remove those injuries from ourselves so that we can actually engage sexually with our soulmate permanently. But it won't be always physically, if that makes sense. It'll be an exchange of sexual energy cycling through yourself and your soulmate constantly, but it won't always have a physical expression. And there's often that misunderstanding. Well, I, I, when I felt these things, it felt like it was much deeper than physical. Exactly. And, yeah. and I've had 
periods of my life when I felt extremely connected to humanity. Yeah. And and I felt a sense of oneness and, and I loved everyone. Yeah. And and I wanted it to be on all mm -hmm. levels and it, it's impossible to do it on the physical with everyone. Exactly. And and it becomes very problematic. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, and we usually have a lot of diseases associated with it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Alright, so a few things to remember at incarnation. At incarnation, these souls of which you were one uh, before you came to earth did not have a self-awareness. At that time you also did not have a sexual identity. You didn't realise your own self and you didn't realize yourself as an individual. You also didn't know yourself as a half of a soul, right? At that particular point when you incarnated, unless your parents knew, you, knew that there were soulmates. Now, because most parents on Earth have no idea about soulmates, of course, they never consider that there is perhaps a soulmate, and so that emotion doesn't flow through them, so it can't flow through you once you incarnate. So when we separate from our soulmate, during the process of incarnation, the time, at the time of separation, there is no knowledge of that separation. There is no consciousness of that separation. It is only after the separation occurs and when we start to be individualized, when it, in other words, when we come to Earth, that we start having a consciousness of ourselves. So it's very important to understand that there is no consciousness of the soul separation in the soul half when it first incarnates. And there's a very good reason why that's the case. Because if, if, if it was conscious of it, it would actually go through many terrible emotions right at that point, before it even incarnated. Does that make sense? Yes. So to incarnate from a not unconscious state, remember the soul still has personality, but is unconscious of itself. When it incarnates, that's the process of creating consciousness of itself. In other words, the process of incarnation is essential for you learning that you're an individual and can exercise your free will. But after a while, you start learning actually that you want to connect to one other person and you want to have this other connection. And that's when you start developing this longing inside of yourself that starts growing for a soulmate. Does that make sense? Now, the reason why I'm bringing up soulmates in this sex and sexuality discussion is because in the end, God intended that you have sex with your soulmate. And in the end, God, in fact, intends if you progress spiritually through all the spheres of the seven spheres and then you go above that to the 21st sphere and eventually you go into a soul union state where you reunite with your soulmate on every level. And in that level you are one soul again. You're not two separate beings. You are one soul that can express itself however it desires. I can speak loud. Oh, it's just that if you don't speak through the mic, then we don't get it recorded, does it? Um, do many people that find their soulmate on Earth and become one sort of thing? And many people find their soulmate on Earth, but often do not have a soul a soulmate relationship with their soulmate. The reason why is a soulmate relationship is dependent upon you having a pu pure emotional condition. All of your masculine and feminine injuries need to be released in order for you to have a pure connection with your soulmate. So for that reason, most people even who meet their soulmate on earth never have a soulmate relationship on earth. And most people in the spirit world have never had a soulmate relationship until they reach the first celestial sphere, which is the eighth sphere of progression. Most people never experience a soulmate relationship until then. That's not very nice, like, why well, not we do well, we can. We can do it here, and that's why I want to show you all of this, so that you can do it all here. Does that make sense? Uh, when we talk about soulmates, we're talking about twin flames. Basically, it's the same thing. 
Um, there is not, there, there is a common concept today that you can have more than one soulmate, but you can only have one twin flame. What I'm saying is that so, the world's concept of soulmate, the new age concept of soulmate, is really about law of attraction attractions. And that's not what I'm talking about when we're talking about soulmate. What we're talking about when we talk about soulmates is the twin flame type of connection where there is only one. There is only one soulmate for each one of you. Who feels that's a pretty bad deal? Some of you probably feel that's a bad deal, right? The reason why is because a lot of times we have emotions like, oh, I want to choose who that is. But the choice, the choice has actually already been made for you. It's just a matter of you coming to recognise it. In other words, God created your, you, yourself and your soulmate as one entity. Who will be your perfect partner once you deal with all of your emotional injury. Yeah. So it's actually a good system. <laughs> I still have some emotions about it to deal with myself. So. Mary, you asked Mike, wasn't saying it was a good system. That's why I actually. <laughs> <laughs> because last night the whole thing was slightly different than that, I can assure you. <laughs> last night it was more like, you know, how come you're my soulmate kind of thing. <laughs> I think I was unhappy with our entire soul. It wasn't it was all the identities and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. It wasn't really that. No, she, she was unhappy with her soulmate being Jesus, basically. That's the deal. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you being Mary. But you are Mary. She's Mary Luck, so she is a Mary of the time. <laughs> anyway, I just want to draw another picture. <laughs> um, if you have any feelings of anger or rage or uh, those kind of emotions towards a male or a female, so in other words, if you have any intergender emotional injuries, you'll find that a soul-mate connection can't really be attracted, or if it is attracted, it won't happen until you release those injuries. You'll also find that you can't grow spiritually to at one moment while you have those injuries. So remember, we have the spheres of progression, right? So, so this was the transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere was the transition of one with God. So at this point, we're at one with God. Now, of course, there's spheres above that. Remember, these are dimensional spaces. Remember, at this point, the sixth sphere is the highest we can grow in natural love. The sixth sphere was that highest point. So remember those things from our introduction? Yep. Now, if we're growing in love, it makes sense, doesn't it, that as we grow in love, we must also be growing in our relationship, whoever we're having a relationship with, in love. So the more we reflect love as a, a, in our partnership, the closer that we will get together. But if we do not progress in divine love, and remember the seventh sphere and above, we can't get to them without having divine love in our soul. Right? So if we don't progress in our relationship with God, then I can't also progress in my relationship with my soulmate. Do you follow that? Not at a soul level. Not at a soul level. So we can have a sexual relationship, and we can even have a very good sexual relationship at this point where we're at one, uh, sorry, when we're um, perfected in natural love, we can have quite a good relationship between each other but we will not be at one with each other, nor will we have the prospect of being at one with each other until we progress in divine love. So in other words, unless you choose to receive divine love, you will never ever be able to be also at one with your soulmate. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? It's a very important thing to understand, that unless you put your relationship with God first, you will never get to be at one with your soulmate. So I'm going to say that again, actually. Unless you put your relationship with God 
first, you will never get to be at one with your soulmate. Does everyone get that? It's really important to understand that at the soul level. Even. Now, God designed it that way so that you would have, when you had a soulmate relationship, it could be that it would grow at infinitum. So as you're receiving divine love, you can receive more and more divine love that will, and you can continue receiving divine love all of your existence. So there is a never-ending supply of divine love which you can receive and grow in. Now, as you grow in that, you then also, as a part of that, grow towards your soulmate. The two of you start becoming one again in a conscious way, not in an unconscious way. Is it worth pointing out as well that while when we incarnate as halves of a soul, we don't have a consciousness of ourselves even as half of a soul or that we have a soul made, but there is a law of attraction that exists between the two halves of the soul. And as we actually develop in love ourselves, that law of attraction actually strengthens and heightens so in fact, even if we just focus on our relationship with God and clearing our emotional injuries, we will attract our soulmate. Yeah. So everyone follows that? So down the bottom here, here's our souls totally disconnected from each other in different bodies. And when I say totally, they're not totally ever totally disconnected. There is a flow of energy that flows between yourself and your soulmate from the moment you incarnate. It's just that you're not aware of it. And so it feels like you don't have a relationship with your soulmate at that point. Does that make sense? And then as you start growing in love, growing towards God in love, each new growth you make actually brings you closer together to your soulmate, as Mary just said. Until eventually, way, way up above the 8th sphere and the 22nd sphere, you actually combine as one again. So, if we think about sex, obviously the sexual relationship gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer until we become one in that as well. Does that make sense, Deborah? Yeah. So that's what we have to look forward to with our spiritual growth. Now, is there any questions about that? Um, it's not so much a uh, question, but the last card in the tarot cards, the major, is an, an aphrodite. And esoterically, they say that's where we are. <coughs> that's where we are to be. Yeah. It must be a point. Yeah, but that... And, um, I'm allowed to try and do yeah, but um, the tarot cards, remember, come from a sixth sphere spirit, though, trying to depict that location. And so they're, the way they're actually feeling about it inside of themselves, the sixth sphere spirit, when they gave the tarot cards, was that you would become sort of like a, passion -le a passionless, desireless being. Similar to how is often portrayed, uh, uh, that a Buddhist may portray to you. Feel, being in a state of nirvana, but actually not being, not having desires anymore, detuning from desires. So while the tarot does actually reflect some of these principles, it's not the same kind of thing of what I'm describing. What I'm describing is at that point, at the 22nd sphere point, you will be full of desire and all of your desires will be harmonious with divine love. You won't be void of desire and therefore insular from desire you will be full of passion and desire. But all those desires will be completely harmony, in harmony with the laws of natural love and the laws of divine love. Does that make sense? So don't feel it's the same thing as becoming, like this point of nirvana, which is actually the sixth fear location, is not the location that we're describing here. Any other? Jen, at the back? Mm -hmm. Jen, down the front. So I'm doing this work 
and my soulmate all of a sudden thinks, my God, I've got to go to the Sunshine Coast for some unknown reason. Um, and we meet, but they're nowhere near even thinking about becoming one with God. How does that happen for them? Is it as simple as I heard about you and that's how I started? Or is it through me that they start to, they just think, wow, I've got to start thinking another way or acting another way? I'm a bit confused about that one. Well, what happens is as, you're, as you grow in love, your law of attraction changes exponentially. So if you can think of your law of attraction like a magnet. So you imagine the magnet, like each time you grow in love, the magnet that is your law of attraction for your soul mate grows exponentially, 10 times every time you grow it into a new sphere of love, right? So you imagine if you've grown to the third sphere of love, you now have a hundred times stronger law of attraction with regard to your soulmate than you had when you're in the first fear. Does that make sense? Now, after a while, the soulmate, even though they might not be consciously aware that this is occurring, they will just feel automatically drawn into your sphere wherever you are. So you might be in a totally different country, but they'll be drawn to coming to that country. You know, that's the way God designed it. Now, if you grow in love to a greater extent again, now you've got a thousand times law of attraction. Now, imagine, like, your soulmate's going to be really struggling now to actually avoid yes. going. <laughs> <laughs> Much to Mary's consternation, this is what happened. <laughs> and uh, so, so for, say, for a period, for myself, for a period over five years, I started working through soulmate issues, start, grieving a lot of soulmate type grief that I had, started working through all of these issues. The more and more I worked through the issues, the more drawn I was to come to Queensland. And after a while, I actually knew that my soulmate was in Queensland. And then when I got to Queensland and dealt with more issues, I actually knew my soulmate was overseas. I hadn't met her, but I knew she was born here in Queensland or something like that. And I knew somehow there was a link to Queensland. So, so that's why I came to Queensland. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> you got hurt. All because of me. You got, <laughs> you got her to blame for me being in your life. <laughs> so every one of you get angry at me. You get angry at me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is what happened. And, and uh, as, as I grew in terms of the expression of love, I, I could feel her more and more, I could feel her emotions more, I could feel her qualities even more, without having met her yet. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that just grew and grew and grew, until eventually the attraction was so strong that she couldn't avoid it, even though she didn't know that's what was happening. And that's what will happen with you, with your soulmate, if you continue to grow in love yourself. Yeah. Um, oh, i ask for Jen next to time. So my question is um, about celibacy and chastity. Yep. Why are those you know, worldly principles, if you like, portrayed as spiritual growth? Like yeah, portrayed as important to spiritual growth. Yeah. yeah. So the two qualities were chastity and celibacy. celibacy. Let's look at celibacy first. Um, it has been commonly thought that if you're celibate, that you will get close to God better than any other time. Now, the reason why this is often the case is because when we're not celibate, we're often so focused on the physical act of sexuality or, or of sex that we become devoid of spirituality in the process. In other words, sexuality and the expression of sexuality becomes just a totally emotionally driven and emotionally injury driven process. Now, because of that, obviously, many people historically have recommended celibacy to get out of that cycle. And I don't recommend it myself. Um, I've had periods of, life, of my life where I've been celibate, and I've chosen that for reasons, and we'll talk about that a little later. But um, celibacy isn't necessarily going to bring you closer to God. In fact, unless you deal with your injuries towards the opposite sex and accept yourself as a sexual being, as part of it, 
sexuality being an integral part of your identity, you'd never be at one with God anyway, because you're in denial of a part of yourself. So that then can't be a vehicle to, say, a pure heart state. No. It, it's an avoidance. Yes, it's an avoidance. So there are many people at the natural love pinnacle, which is the sixth sphere, who do not engage in sexual activity at all. So they're in the spirit world, in the sixth sphere, and they do not have anything to do with sex because they believe with all their heart that that's the only way for them to be connected to God. Of course, they deny quite a lot in that process. The fact, the fact that we have sex organs in both the physical body and the spirit body proves, in fact, that God created sexuality to be a part of this process. And they don't think of that, though. But they, they, they've been taught over and over that you've got to be pure, you know, you've got to be... And they then say purity can't be had if you're involved with sex. So therefore, the teaching of celibacy for sex is the experience. Yep. Is, is not... It's not the pathway, it's not, it's not the end. No, it'll, it, it'll help them remain in the sixth sphere and they'll have a lot of bliss in their life, but they will not experience the complete bliss that occurs with the soul union ever until they recognise the difference. And a lot of soul damage does happen because people are driven by, soul, uh, by sexual injuries, but that's some, so they can minimise their soul damage by not being driven by those injuries, but in the end they need to deal with injuries. So a person who's celibate often still has sexual injuries inside of themselves. They're just not expressing them, right? And they're just not feeling them. They're detuned from them. But they often still have them inside of themselves. And the only way you're ever going to be at one with God is by removing all injuries, including our sexual injuries, from inside of ourselves at the causal level. So now is the war of chastity in the religious sense that's advocated in, you know, in the world or in the, in, the, in the belief systems, is that then have the same result? When you say the law of chastity, if I sort of define it a little for everyone, more that more it's more depicting that promiscuity is an error. So in other words, so the reason why the law of chastity was created as a moral law to help people progress spiritually is that it was to remind people that actually promiscuity is actually going to cause you soul damage. And that is true. Promiscuity does cause you soul damage. So we'll talk about that in a minute, just, just all the different types of damages that occur at the soul level. And promiscuity is certainly one of them. So the law of chastity can certainly help you right, remain free of those, of those soul damages that, that occur through promiscuity. But, like I said in the first century, if you long for a woman in your heart that's not your wife or not your partner, you've already committed a doctor in your heart anyway. All right? So the truth is that you can actually be living a life of chastity, and many who are doing it religiously are doing this. They live a life of chastity, and every night they have all of these dreams about, you know, and how you know they'd like to be with this person, like to be with that person, and they probably masturbate in front of pictures of different people with pornography or whatever, but still staying so called chaste. But at the soul level, the damage is there already. The sexual damage is there already that needs to be worked through anyway. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So it's pointless, like living any law, whatever the laws are, it's pointless living it here if you're not feeling it in your soul. And that applies to the law of chastity. If you feel like going out and having sex with a hundred women, right, it's pointless you not addressing that issue at the soul level and just, and just being chaste or being celibate to get over that issue. Because in the end, the issue remains within you. And, the, and this is all about dealing with all the issues that remain within us. Any other questions? So, what's God's perspective? God created sex for your enjoyment. That's first. It's pretty obvious that it's not just for procreation. If you look at the design of a man's body and the design of a woman's body, a man can come to orgasm without penetrating the woman, and a woman can come to orgasm without being penetrated. 
So therefore, sex isn't just for procreation. Agreed? It's got to be for other purposes. Now, if we have injuries with regard to sexuality, and we have injuries with regard to sex itself, that is going to prevent us from becoming at one with God. Do we understand that? So how many of you before have thought, oh, this sex issue, I can just avoid it. Like, I can get around it, I can sort of manoeuvre it. How many of you have felt like you really don't like sex at all? How many feel that way, that you really don't like sex at all? Quite, just a few? Okay. How many of you feel like sex is good, but, but you didn't realise that if, that if you had an injury regarding it, you would never get to be at one with God? So how many of us realise it? So that's the majority. Okay. So this is a truth of God, that while we have an injury with regarding sex, we have an injury in our relationship with God. So we need to look at the types of injuries we might have. Does that make sense? And, uh, and examine them a bit more closely. So, you notice in the section, God's, um, this section, sexuality from God's perspective, there's a few little things I'd like to discuss, though, with regard what is basic sexuality. Remember, in our introductory sessions, that we drew the soul thus, the two halves of the soul, right? And we said that those two halves, when they split, could turn out to have a male body, on both sides or a female body on one side so basically each half could be connected to a male or a female body does that make sense now if the soul itself the whole combined soul is dominantly feminine in nature when it splits it will attract two feminine bodies so that is what you would call nowadays on earth, a sex, in terms of a sexual relationship, a lesbian relationship, right? It could also, if it was dominantly masculine, the entire soul, when it splits, it would split into two male bodies, which is what on earth you would call a homosexual relationship, right? Or a gay relationship. Then there's the split where if, it, if it's a mixture of masculine and feminine, when it splits, it would split into a male body and a female body. Right? Now that obviously would be sexually a heterosexual relationship, agree? So can you see that actually there is no bisexuality in that? So bisexuality, the feeling inside of ourselves that we're attracted to both males and females, sexually attracted to both males and females, comes from soul injuries within us. And by the way, they don't come from our own soul injuries. It comes from soul injuries within our parents, not within ourselves, generally. You also, um, now that is quite controversial to say, right? For a lot of people. A lot of people will find that quite controversial. AJ, can you give an example of what you mean? Um, well, let, let's illustrate it from a soul perspective first. If this is a male, if this is a dominantly masculine soul, and this is a dominantly, uh, so the dominantly masculine combined soul I'm talking, then it's going to split into two male bodies. Right. So that's one possibility. If it's a dominantly feminine soul, this will be feminine and this will be mostly feminine, so it will split into two female bodies. Right. The alternative is if, if it's a sort of half-half, if you like, male-female, then one half will be male, one half will be female, and one side will be male and one side will be female. But you notice in each case there is no, there's, there's not an attraction to two genders. So any attraction that develops within us to both genders comes from emotional injuries within our parents generally. And it's to do with their emotional injuries regarding sexuality in most cases. What kind of oneness on a soul level that you can, uh, just a one for the soul that you can have in connection to you? Well, 
let's look at bisexuality. If, if a person is bisexual, that means they have an attraction, sexual attraction, to men and women. And this is concurrent sexual attraction, is it not? A sexual attraction to men and a sexual attraction to women at the same time. It exists within them at the same time. Now, if we're only a half of a soul, is that actually possible at the soul level? So if it's not possible at the soul level, and it's happening at the physical level, the only answer can be that there has to be due to emotional injuries occurring inside of the soul. But if we're one with your soul. When you say at one with your soul, what do you mean? Well, if you have a soulmate, you're at one. Why can't you have them both? You're at one with your own sexuality. Well, that's the 20 seconds fear state. Okay, so why can't you be bisexual with you, the soul, The soul isn't made to have sexual relationships with other souls. It's made to have a sexual relationship with itself. This is what I'm saying. I know it's highly confrontational, but it's exactly what I'm saying about God's truth. So, what I'm saying is from God's perspective, God created the two soul halves to eventually merge into one. Now, if the two soul halves emerge into one, they will not even desire a sexual relationship with another entity. Do you follow me? And, and so if we desire a sexual relationship with multiple partners, we need to look very strongly at the emotional injuries within us that would actually cause us to do that. And usually it's deep levels of dissatisfaction in us regarding each relationship but there might be many, many types of injuries associated with that. You were going to say something? I was just going to point out, it's similar to, um, like each half of the soul has its innate um, sexual identity and attraction. Um, but often throughout life, as a result of different injuries, emo sexual, emotional injuries, that um, sexual um, preference, if you like, can be tainted. So there, there are people on earth today living as homosexuals who actually have heterosexual um, soul qualities and there are actually people who are living as heterosexuals who in their pristine state are actually a homosexual soul, if that makes sense. So for me the issue of bisexuality falls very much in that similar category. There's an injury or a confusion around sexual identity that um, is causing the confusion. Yeah. And I, let me give you an example of this. Like a few years ago I had a chat with a spirit with some spirits that had passed. It was a male and a female spirit who came to me and they wanted to talk because the the male spirit was in the first sphere, but he was in quite a high condition in the first sphere. And the female spirit was in a low condition. She was in one of the hells of the first sphere. They had been married when they were on earth. So what had happened is the male, the male spirit had passed first, right? So what had happened is he had, he had passed, he had died and passed, and then five years later his wife died and passed. And two years after that they came to speak with me. So that the male had been passed seven years now and the female for two years. Now the reason why they came to me was because they wanted to know the male was trying to help the female spirit to get her into a better condition so that they could both live together. In other words, they wanted to continue their husband and wife relationship that they had while they were on earth in the spirit world. And the female spirit was getting very angry with the male spirit, right? And the reason why is the male spirit was living in a higher place, which was more beautiful, and she kept on saying, why can't you take me there? Right? Why can't I carry there with you? And he was saying, well, you can't. You know, they tried, they tried to make it happen. They couldn't make it happen. It was too painful for her. And so in the end, she was consigned to living in this, in this hellish place. And he, was, and he lived in this higher first year state near Summerland. And he then, uh, he then, she then said to him, well, why don't you come and live with me? Well, would you want to? You know, would you want to go and live in the hell with somebody? 
uh, if you already were living in a place that was quite pretty and nice. Well, obviously, he didn't want to do that either. And that was one of the reasons why she was quite angry. Anyway, both of them came to me and started talking about their situation, how they could get out of the situation. The specific question that they asked was, the, the lady wanted to know how she could be in the same place as the man was in. Then I described this thing called, remember I talk about it quite often, called soul condition. So I talked to them about soul condition, what soul condition was. Now soul condition is a reflection of all of your emotions and how harmonious they are with natural love or divine love. And I said to her that she had a poorer soul condition than her mate, than the man. And the reason why she had was while they were on earth, she dominated the relationship. So in other words, all of her life together with him on earth, she was constantly pressuring him to do things which he went ahead and did. And he eventually was very oppressed by the relationship. So he passed, and then she passed, and she still expected to oppress him in the spirit world as well. Right? She wanted to keep that going. So I talked to her about her soul condition. Now she wasn't very interested in that at all. She was quite dismissive. How can that be? You know, she was questioning, she was criticizing me, being occasionally sarcastic with me as well. And, but the man was very interested. So the man asked more questions. And then I started talking about soulmates. And it turned out that the man, within a very short space of time, started realizing that maybe his wife wasn't his soulmate. And as soon as he started feeling that, his wife felt the whole soulmate issue herself, even though she was in the hills, and she immediately attracted her soulmate, who came to her, who happened to also be in the hills. And they just went off. They didn't bother talking to me anymore. That was the end of our conversation. They just went off, and he wasn't with her anymore from that moment, right? And then he started, we started talking about soul mates with him. And I felt that his soul was actually a gay soul. It was, his, his soul mate was male. And once we discard, started talking about all that, he knew who that was. And he straight away started resolving some of these sexual injuries within himself. So he was living in a heterosexual relationship all of his life on earth and for two years in the spirit world after his wife joined him as well. And yet after all of that, all it required was one discussion about his feelings about sexuality and he realised that actually he was gay. Now that happens all the time in the spirit world where people on earth have lived in heterosexual relationships due to emotional pressures of all different types and yet when they've passed in the spirit world, realised that actually they were gay. Louise? Hey, Jamie, um, Can we wait for the mic? Um, the, the people that have gay um, soulmate partners, are they happy to realise that they have both gay soulmate partners or are they disappointed sometimes? Um, almost every single person who ever realises their soulmate at some point is disappointed with the choice God has made. Um, <laughs> um, the reason why is many fold. So it's all to do with the emotions. So a lot of times in the spirit world you could introduce a soulmate couple and they'll take one look at each other and say, nah, that can't be my soulmate. And they'll go off for another 50 years and have other relationships, and then come back 50 years later realising that that person probably is their soulmate. And this happens not just because of sexuality. It happens because of all sorts of emotions within the soul. You know, what we expect, what we expect them to look like, what condition we expect them to be in, and all sorts of things. When you think about it today, if you, you get most women making a list on the internet, right? You know, who have you done internet dating? I have, so you can learn to put up your hand. <laughs> yeah, see more people than me. But I did internet dating, and you know, you start describing yourself, right? So you describe, you know, how, how, and all of it's physical, isn't it? Most of it. 
you know, you're this whole, you're this, you're this. Then they start talking about your likes and your dislikes, but very little of that is your soul. All right? And so the majority of people are only attracted to other people based on common likes, common dislikes, uh, in terms of physical attractiveness and all these other aspects. But very little of those are actually based around the soul, what's really going on at the soul level. And so for that reason, when people pass in the spirit world and meet their soulmate, they look at their soulmate and go, that's not what I expected, it, you know? Without any further ado, dismissing the whole thing and going off with another person, and then coming back many, many years later, sometimes centuries later, realizing that that person was actually the soulmate. And this happens all the time. So yes, many people in the spirit world meet their soulmates and are very disappointed. Can you imagine if you were, uh, if you were a, uh, if you were not developed in love, and somebody came along and said, "Look, I'll take you to see your soulmate," and this is in the spirit world. And so they grab your hand and they take you down to the hills, down, down, down into the hills, right? Way, way, way down. And this has actually happened to some of my friends in the spirit world. Way, 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 way down. And you're almost to the bottom of the hills. And there's this terrible, ugly thing, right? Literally, like just laying on the ground in this terrible amount of pain. And then they say, oh, that's your soulmate. <laughs> you imagine that? Would you be very impressed? <laughs> and some, some people feel quite angry with God that that's the way it is and all sorts. This is what actually happened to quite a number of people historically where they've had soulmates that have been in terrible conditions. So a soulmate is not necessarily what you are going to be physically attracted to. But if you open up your soul you will find a huge attraction at the soul level. And then as that attraction grows, you will find as they grow in love, they become more physically attractive anyway. So in the spirit world, by the time you get to the second sphere, you're actually looking pretty good. Right? All of those you know, big, you know, big, terrible, destructive looking, yeah, what would you call it? It's just terrible. Um, this ugly looking face gets transformed into someone that's about 40 or 45 looking. And by the time they're in the third sphere, it's about 30. By the time you're in the fourth sphere or the fifth sphere, it's about in the late 20s. By the time you hit the sixth sphere, you're all about 25, right? In terms of the way you look. And everyone's got nice bodies, you know? Everyone's built. And, uh, and so you're more and more attractive. Of course, it's not very important because everyone's like that. So you imagine walking down the beach you know, at the moment you walk down the beach and there's a guy there with, you know, good abs and big shoulders and he's walking around like... <laughs> showing himself off a bit or there's a girl there, you know, just wiggling her hips and legs. Like, and, and, and she's she knows she's the most beautiful thing on the beach, right? In the spirit world, imagine that every single person on the beach looks like that. So in the third sphere, that's what it's like. Every single person on the beach looks like that. So would you start looking at how they look? No. You start looking at deeper qualities, don't you? And this is what the soul attraction is all about, looking at the deeper qualities. Does that make sense? Yes. So understand that what you're seeing physically is a very, very minor, minor part of attraction. And we'll talk about attraction a little in a minute. Have we covered all of that information, though? Because that's really important. Have we done that? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. We've covered most of that. All right, question up the back there. Thanks. How can it um, be possible for like your soulmate to be in such a low condition and you in a high condition? And remember that each half of the soul is exercising its own free will. So while you're here on Earth, you can independently, as a half of your soul, exercise free will independently from your soulmate which actually means that you can make choices independent from their, what they would like you to make. And uh, the result of that, of course, is if those choices are disharmonious with love, your soul condition just keeps on going into a more degrading state. And as your soul condition goes into a more degrading state, so does your physical form and your spirit body form. 
So there's many people who pass over into the spirit world who come and tell you, I'm fine. In reality, they have very, very poor looking spirit bodies and they're very disappointed, but they don't know what else to say other than I'm still alive and I'm fine to you. Does that make sense? And there's lots of spirits here in that position at the moment who, who are listening to this. They're in this terrible condition from a physical point of view. They're wanting to have sex, but they don't, you know, they can, it, sex is a dim, dark memory for them, for many of them, because they're so ugly that they can't even bring themselves to look at another person, let alone have sex with them. Do you follow me? So there's a lot of that going on in the spirit world in the hells or in the first sphere of the spirit world. And it's all to do with this thing called soul condition. As a soul condition, the choices that we make on earth, as we make those choices, if the choices are in disharmony with love, our soul condition degrades, and we can do that independently of what our soul mate is doing. Does that make sense? So, just say, like, someone's in 20 seconds sphere, right? Yep. So, and their soul mate's like, done nothing, and they're like, in the first sphere, wouldn't that other half of their soul being in the 20 second sphere sort of raise their vibration up? Yes, just with one proviso though, you can't get into the 20 second sphere state without your soulmate in the same state. Yeah. So any, any, sec any state under that, the 21st sphere and under, what you're saying is de dead right. The, the, whole part, the beautiful part about soulmates is if one half of the soulmate grows in love, the other half of the soulmate feels a stronger and stronger attraction to them whether they're in the hells or in not very good condition or not. So this is why it's so important to focus firstly on your relationship with God. And if they were in that high like, position, they wouldn't even like, attract their soulmate sort of thing because their soulmate's so low. Like, they, you know what I mean? It wouldn't even, the law of attraction wouldn't even bring them together. No, the law of attraction does bring them together. Most of the time, the, the spirit who's in the higher location knows who their soulmate is way before the spirit in the lower location knows. So they're often praying for them and trying to help them and they're waiting for them to get into a certain condition before they physically help them. So the likelihood of a soulmate couple being in the first and 21st sphere is highly unlikely? Yeah, very unlikely. I was just saying that. Yeah, most of the time if, if, a, if the soulmate enters the one state there is such an attraction for the other half of the soul to, to be with them. And, this, and by that stage, the person in the one state knows who their soulmate is for certain, so they are constantly trying to assist them anyway. So it's highly unlikely that that would continue as the person's growing and growing into higher states in higher dimensions. There's a really nice pageant message from Nero. Um, have you mentioned that before? Yeah, I have, but not, not recently. It's just about him, his soulmate coming to find him in the hells and helping him. It's nice. Yeah. That's a good message. So Nero, you've heard of Nero? Uh, a, Roman, a Roman emperor. Um, my suggestion is to read that message because it describes how soulmates can help each other in the spirit world. And here on earth, probably. Um, there's only three or four messages of, from Nero in the entire pageant messages, so... If you've got the CD wrong, just hit, like, enter find Nero. Yeah. Um, I was trying that last night, and it was set to my whole hard drive. I think it's in book three. Okay. So if you open book three, um, and do a search in book three for Nero, I think you'll find it. You've sent it out once. I have sent it out it once, but it was a while ago, yeah. Um, Jen, thanks. So is it God who decides how soulmates split? And um, in that split, um, of, in regards to sexuality, can there be, for want of a better way of putting it, an imbalance between sexual expression and non-sexual expression? And first question is, does God create the, the split? Yes, God creates the how the soul splits. And the soul splits every single time the same way. So if the soul reincarnates, it splits in the same way. Not with the same memories, but in the same way, the soul splits every single time. It's sort of like you can think of the whole soul with a little crack down the middle, a bit like a seed. 
you know how when you get a seed like an almond out of a pod and you can pry the two halves of the almond apart? So it's one almond, but you can pry the two apart and they just fit together just perfectly. So equal amounts of sexuality and sexual potential in each both halves of the soul. Yes. And so if one has a, on earth has a more dominant and the other one a more sub submissive role, that is due to emotional injuries. Does that make sense? And so it's a matter of dealing with those emotional injuries. It's, so many of us would like to believe that, oh, you know, there's some I've heard say, you know, oh, sex once a month is often enough for me. Right? How many of you have felt that in the past at some point? I had sex once at five years, so that I have to put myself up. Now, that's only because of something you're working through from an emotional perspective. This is not withstanding choices you might make, of course. The truth is that God created this sexual expression as a, uh, to be highly intense for both halves. And in fact, once the two halves actually deal with their injuries, the two halves will have the same intensity of sexual expression. That, can vary. that will vary from complete soul to complete soul, yes. But it will not vary for the two halves. So in other words, my desire for sexual expression and Mary's desire for sexual expression will be identical once we've both dealt with all of our sexual injuries. So your soul union will be different perhaps my soul. Yes. Soul. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's some souls that don't have as strong a, as strong a desire for each other as other souls, but that's just because. But their, their desire for each other is identical, and the desire, by the way, for each other does grow as you receive divine love. So the soul expands, so your desires expand as well. Um, why aren't they both the same age? Why on earth you mean? Why from a soul perspective they're the same age? In terms of a physical body perspective, they can be all sorts of ages, usually, you know, usually within 20 years of, of each other, but they can be even further. And that's totally dependent on lots of lots and lots of environmental factors. And it's all to do with the laws of attraction of parents and personalities and all sorts of law of attraction events that control when one half of the soul incarnates and when the other half of the soul incarnates. So the key is to not get hung up on age. In the end, you'll all look 25 anyway. So. And you'll so, never get too old for sex. You never get too old for sex. <laughs> yes. Yes, obviously, almost every soul mate who has been aborted or miscarried never spends much time here on earth but their soul mate may live a full life on earth and never meet their soul mate because of the abortion or the miscarriage so yes there are times and obviously there's what 50 million abortions every year so there's 50 million soul mates every single year who don't get to spend time with their soul mate on earth all right so this is part of the problem part of the problem with abortion for example is you're not only taking away the free will of the child you just aborted, you're taking away the free will of its partner too, you know, to a large degree. So that's why it's such a serious thing. Does that make sense? But as you develop in love, the law of attraction still works. So even if your soulmate is has passed, they'll still be attracted to you. Does that make sense? So what you'll find is that many people who have passed uh, maybe aborted or miscarried on earth or died very young on earth, never met their soulmate on earth, they pro progress to the third or fourth or fifth sphere and by that stage they usually know who their soulmate is on earth and from that moment on they spend heaps of time with that person. Now they spend heaps of time with you in your awake state but when you're in your sleep state they try and meet up with you and spend time with you in your sleep state as well. Does that make sense? And in the end you can have a seamless relationship with them in the sense that you can have a permanent relationship with a spirit and it can be also be a sexual relationship. But it just depends on you developing your soul condition. And very few people on earth do that, of course, because they want physical touch or they want that, you know, those kind of expressions. And so 
they don't, you know, they'd rather go for an earth-based relationship rather than that kind of a relationship. But it is possible. Up back next. <coughs> Yep. So if the baby's aborted and goes into the spirit world, what form are they in the spirit world? They're, like you've mentioned before that we're, we're like we are now. No, no, they're a little baby. Yeah. And they grow, uh, they're nursed in the summer land by, by, um, by a, usually a celestial spirit. And they're actually taught many beautiful things. By the time they're three or four years of age, they know a lot more than what we do here on Earth by the time we're 70, generally. And, uh, and they have a very full existence and life and are loved very much. And they are offered the two paths of progression as well, the natural love path or the divine love path. But they're never forced to make a choice between. They just make their own choices. As to how fast their physical body grows, well, that's totally dependent upon their own desire. So their physical body grows as, as they desire it to grow. Okay. Um, when you're, t you're talking about age before between couples, when, when a, a soul is split in the two halves, yep. that happens when a child is born, is that right? They, no, at, at, at conception. Conception, sorry. Yep. So when that soul splits into two, it immediately goes into at two conception like be not immediately days. no you have one go into one and the other will hover in the spirit in the spirit state waiting for a chance to incarnate nearby where the first one incarnated generally okay that's fine well there could be a, an age difference and often there might be an age difference soulmates. there will be an age difference between soulmates always uh, they don't ever generally incarnate into say twins or something like that that would be a highly rare occasion i've never seen that occur but the, one, the first one will incarnate, the second one w hovers around the first waiting for incarnation and then incarnates. And that difference in years, Earth time might be 20 years. Of course, the one left behind doesn't notice the difference in time because they're not conscious of themselves yet and they're not conscious of time. Uh, Peter, thanks. You were saying that uh, a child gets a choice to uh, to go on the natural love path or the divine love path in the spirit world. Yep. It's hard to understand for me why someone would choose the natural love path when the implications for the divine love path are so awesome. This is a recurring question we do, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> why would anyone choose the natural love path? Uh, is it the people who are uh, presenting the opportunities in the spirit world not very good salespeople? <laughs> <laughs> is it there lies the emotional injury. <laughs> um, in the spirit world, you are never forced into making a choice. You make your own choices. And this is something that's paramount. A celestial spirit understands this more than anyone. And so a celestial spirit never is a salesperson. They present the two choices and they present the advantages to the person. But you see, a child is also influenced by their, by their siblings on Earth. They're, intru they're influenced by their parents' emotions if, if their parents are still on Earth. And they're influenced by their parents' emotions if their parents have passed. So there is a, a large variety of influences on that child that's being nursed by a celestial spirit besides the celestial spirit themselves. And it's those influences often that determine what choices the child makes initially. So for example, if all of the child's mates are all on the natural love path it, and it wants to choose the divine love path, there's all this pressure to go on the natural love path by its friends. So naturally, a lot of people go onto the natural love path because of that. So it's not a matter of whether it's to do with advertising or any of those things. It's to do with the laws of attraction that are operating upon the emotions of the child at the time. And those laws of attraction will depend on the parent's emotions, its mate's emotions, its friend's emotions, what it feels itself is going to be the best thing to do for itself. 
and that that will be a wide variety of emotions impacted upon the child before it makes a decision. Of course, many of them don't understand that all of those impacts are not really worth anything compared to the relationship with God. But how many of you find being honest about your relationship with God on this earth easy? Like, it's not easy, is it? You start talking about God with people and what do they say? You start talking about being at one with God, what do they say? You know, you start talking about, you know, following what Jesus taught in the first century, what do they say? You know, you get all these judgments and everything. And this still occurs in the spirit world as well, you get all these judgments. So there's been many times where, like I remember one instance in the spirit world where this grandmother, this newborn child, died soon after uh, being born, uh, passed into the spirit world, and the grandmother, who was in one of the hills, was trying to influence its decisions. Right? And the child felt drawn, because of its connection to its parents on earth, to go to the grandmother all the time, and the child wanted to listen to what the grandmother was saying, but it didn't feel right to the child. And so the child also had some celestial spirits surrounding it, trying to explain you know, that actually this is your grandmother talking through her emotional injuries, right? Your grandmother's not going to feel like this later on, and things like that. But it's very, very hard. You imagine, you're just a child, and you've got all this pressure on you already to actually conform to what the parents or the grandparents want. So often they follow that. A celestial spirit will never interfere with free will, so mm. that's it. But someone in the hells might be a very good salesman. <laughs> so people in the hells are salesmen that want to influence free will. People in the celestial state will never do that. They will always just respond to what the desire of the individual is all the time. Um, and James, and, uh, James first, and then you were talking about the the male soul that splits into gay a gay soul and yep. female there. I was wondering, is the distribution of the souls, maleness and females, more or less like the bell curve of distribution? Yes, and more like a statistical bell curve. So it's the ends of the bell, if you like, that are the dominantly masculine and the dominantly feminine, and they split, and the majority of the souls split into a heterosexual type of relationship on Earth. Obviously God made it that way so that procreation of the human race would continue. If the dominant split was homosexual or lesbian, then there wouldn't be much procreation perhaps occurring and so you know it would be much more difficult for the human race to continue but God's, God made the split in the same way that he makes many other splits with or, or many other things right a variety right the way through all of creation and the ends of that variety the dominantly masculine and the dominantly feminine are the homosexual souls if you like and the ones in the middle are the heterosexual souls yeah. And so God, from God's perspective, they are all her children and they are all loved as much as each other from God's perspective. The problem is our perspective. We often have very many injuries in terms of love ourselves. We often have very many phobias and many of those things include homophobias. And we need to deal with those things emotionally. Is that right? <coughs> Uh, this is a question um, regarding the, uh, the soul before it splits and then one half gets incarnate and the other one not being aware of itself, would it actually miss the other half? Would it feel...? No. The part that hasn't yet incarnated doesn't miss the one that's incarnated and the one that's incarnated doesn't miss the other half either right at the point of incarnation. If the parents are aware of soulmates and if the parents are in fact at one with God when they have the child, then the soulmate longing will begin at the point of conception. Does that make sense? But if the parents are not aware of soulmate relationship or they have intergender injuries, which is the majority of parents in the human race, then what happens is that even the soul that's incarnated already will not start feeling its soul longing until usually it gets up into the ages of like the puberty ages when it starts feeling those longings. But the truth is that it can have those longings far, far earlier in life. But unfortunately the majority of parents are not aware of the truth which prevents that longing from occurring. Another question. 
Um, this is about the use of the pill as a contraception. Yep. And um, I, I might be wrong here, but my understanding is that uh, what how the pill works is that the woman still ovulates, I think, and um, and it actually just doesn't allow that uh, conceived embryo to settle in the uterus and grow. There's there's a few different types of pills. There is that kind of a pill which which actually kills the embryonic child, if you like. There's another, other types of pill prevent the process of conception altogether. So if my suggestion, if you're going to go on the pill, look at the ones that prevent the process of conception. If you, but, that, but again, that is a free will choice in terms of what... So uh, that, that would mean if you're taking the one that actually kills the embryonic um, uh, child, yep. that would actually be like a, an, an abortion. That, that it's similar to an abortion, yes. It's like the morning after pill. Yeah. Yep. Um. I have a question about um, sex changes. Yep. Um, I, I'm assuming that that is a, um, a soul error something, but what does it actually mean? Where does it come from? Um. Now, this is getting into a really big area of discussion, um, which we can talk about. Um, myself and Mary have spent a lot of time discussing this together. Um, there are two types of pro processes going on with the sex chain. Well, there's a lot more than that, actually. I think I've mentioned them in the previous thing I've said. Oh, yes. Notice under basic, what is basic sexuality? I've got unimpeded soul connection. This is the fourth main point down. Unimpeded soul connection with the spiritual and physical bodies is essential for sexual organ development. And then I've said severe prior generation, transgenerational emotional injuries regarding sexuality and self-identity affect the new soul's connection to the body, the production of hormones, chromosomal abnormalities in the genetic structure, and spirit connections attracted by parents' emotional condition. Now those four things that I've mentioned there affect how the sexual organs develop while you're in the womb. They also, so that there, there, are, there are a lot of things going on during the time of gestation inside of the womb. Now all of those things affect how the sexual organs actually de develop and there are also um, many genetic abnormalities that occur due to emotions within the parents and the grandparents. In other words, transgenerational emotional injuries that impact upon the genetic structure physically, that impact upon the union of the sperm and the egg cell, that then impact upon the development of the child's body that's connected to the soul. Now, obviously, all of those problems can all be sorted out if we grow in our condition of love. So that's the thing to bear in mind in all of those things. Rather than discuss every single one of them, um, when it comes to sex change operations, there's usually two main factors driving them. One is that they have chromosomal abnormalities, and then they have to choose a gender. Now that only happens, I think there's only 600 reported cases in the world today of that occurring. So 606 billion uh, reported cases of that actually occurring, which is... Uh, which is a very minor amount, obviously, and that just shows you how much the genetic structure must have been manipulated by parental injuries in sexuality. <laughs> there are quite a lot of people looking for sex change operations compared to that. And the reason why that, op that often is occurring is because of heavy spirit influence from the moment of, of conception. For instance, many people have a spirit connecting to them at the moment of conception that the parent's emotional condition can't prevent. And the spirit is actually of a different gender than the person themselves. So in other words, I'm a male, I'm a male just incarnated, and I've got a female spirit, a young female spirit, maybe connecting to my body from the moment of incarnation, or soon after. And my parent's emotional condition didn't prevent that from occurring. And so now, when I'm born, I'm, I'm a male, but I've got heavy female spirit influence trying to use my body through you to, to interact with the earth through me. Now that causes huge emotional problems from that day onwards. 
from the time of conception onwards, really. And so I, I may actually grow up, be a male, four or five years old, thinking that I'm a female because of this heavy mediumistic connection that I have with a female spirit. So can you see how, like, just the emotional conditioning can modify lots of different things. Now, if I'm into my teens, I'm going to be very, if I'm still this heavily connected to this female spirit, I'm going to be very disappointed with my body's development and start wanting to cut things off and replace them with other things, for example. Right? So um, what I've found is that many people I've met who have uh, desire for sex change type operations are heavily mediumistic and are heavily influenced by spirits motivating their choices. And unfortunately, with all the psychological testing, you can't test for that. Because they feel they're female, they've got this strong female entity connecting through them right from the time they even were, were, were um, perceived. And so you imagine that. So every psychological barrage that you can aim at them, you'll come back with they feel they're female. And so they go ahead with the sex change operations. Unfortunately, it confuses them at the time of their passing. Because when they pass, the spirit connection separates automatically. And so now they're in this quasi, very difficult place of no longer feeling they're heavily female anymore, but can, you know, realizing they're male, realizing how the connection occurred, it's a very, very distressing place for many of the spirits who pass in that state. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, that's a short explanation of a very long question, actually. Carol, thank you. Jay, there's, there's, you say there's only about 600 in the world of children that are born with bisexual or hermaphrodites. Yeah. I, as a young nurse, in a couple of months' period in the yep. Brisbane hospital, I saw probably about five, and then they're, they're hidden away and they're operated on. Well, I, I may be wrong because yeah. I've just gone by the statistics presented. Yeah, I don't know and, that they're And a lot of them might be hidden. Yeah, so. because these children were just very um, stealthily nursed for a couple of weeks and operated on a decision had yeah. to be made by doctors and parents as to what, what will we make them. Yeah. You know, where do they stand in all this? Yeah, it's a very poor decision actually. To, a decision should not be made actually at that point because it, it creates... And the decision is actually being made because of the injuries of the doctors and the nurses and the parents and all that, the emotional injuries regarding sexual identity. Because if they realise that, hang on a sec, obviously this person has two types of sexual organs um, and, and they then went down the road of right. There's something going on at the soul level here, parents and everything, so we can't al allow the parents to make the choice really as to being operated on this person. This person really needs to be making their own choices. Now even with that, I read some things up about some hermaphrodites who were born with uh, an XXXY chromosome. They grew up, but they were abused by men sexually because they had both men and female or sexual organs. They were abused by family members, mostly men. In one case, we read they were abused by men and women in the family. Now, how confusing are they? Are they how confused are they going to be sexually? So, so this person didn't do anything. Like they, they didn't have their organs cut off or, or replaced, which is a good thing, I believe and they were left to develop. Now, if they developed in divine love and became at one with God, by the time they'd be at one with God, they'd actually be healed and their body would reflect their soul's true gender. So that would all happen automatically. So there is no need to go cutting off things and, and, and hiding them even. And we only do that because of the emotional injuries that are in the community and in the persons, you know, the parents and, and others, that are then imposed upon that child. Which, ironically, are the same emotional injuries that created their condition. Um, just a couple of quick questions on. Um, one part of the soul moved away. You know, Oh, I saw their beautiful soul, mate, Absolutely. and so, walked away. Yeah. I said, you're too beautiful. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Why would you? Why yeah, would you? yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm looking like a boy, you know. <laughs> um, 
Is there anything like a common debt? Pay or balance or? Um, Not really. You, you've made a choice based on your own soul condition of rejection of your soulmate. Obviously, your soulmate is going to feel that rejection if they are connected. And so, obviously, at the soul level, there is going to be emotions felt by both of you at some point in the future. Now, for the soulmate that's rejected, often the emotions that, and they know that they're conscious, they're conscious of their soulmate, they'll feel their emotions then and there, probably, of rejection and so forth. Their soulmate might feel the emotion later. But it just depends. So there's nothing like an Akashic record or a karmic debt or something like well, that? Well, the Akashic record is actually a record within your own soul of your own emotional condition. And so, you know, there is such a thing that exists, certainly, but, it, but it's not there for penalty or punishment. It's just, a, it's just your own emotional condition at that particular moment. And so the key is to allow yourself to feel your emotions. So if in the spirit world any of you pass and you're introduced to your soulmate by a very uh, happy-looking celestial spirit who <laughs> assures you that this is your soulmate, even though you don't want to believe it, then my suggestion is work through your emotional injuries first before you say, no, I've got to walk away. Because you'll find that there's a lot of happiness in connecting with your soulmate. And secondly, it's uh, my understanding that a child chooses parents for certain lessons. Yeah. Um, so if I don't agree with that at all. Okay. Yeah. The, right. the truth is that the parents choose the child through the law of attraction. The child has a, is not conscious of itself before incarnation. So remember I've said in past lessons that reincarnation has only begun since 19, in the 1960s. And before then, um, reincarnation did not occur. And all of the so-called teachings of reincarnation before then are all based on unloving premises anyway. The, the second thing is that reincarnation cannot occur until the soul reaches the 22nd sphere state in a soul union condition. That's the only state that reincarnation can occur. And that be being the case, um, obviously then, if the person's in that state, they can make choices. But in the first incarnation, the incarnation that the majority or all of pretty much all of you have had the first incarnation. In that incarnation, you are not aware of the choices you're making because you don't have self-awareness. Right? And this is why many of you can't remember the process of incarnation even. Because if you were reincarnated, you would remember that process of incarnation and you'd understand the choices you made and why you made them. And you would be fully conscious of that fact, generally, if you deal with your emotions. It all gets back to dealing with your emotions anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jenny? You made a lot of these, you know? Mine's a difficult question to ask. But I'd like to understand why women menstruate, why, why we not go through the cycle, yep. and what that really means uh, from God's perspective. Yep. And in your pure, pristine state, you will not menstruate. Um, <laughs> you won't have period pain or any of those kind of things. You won't even have childbirth pain. In fact, there's been some recorded cases, and I think one of Mary's friends said to Mary once about one of her friends. Oh no, I met a woman. In, oh, yeah. in Switzerland, I sat down at this little tavern with my friend, and we, my friend had just had a baby, and we just met this amazing French woman who spoke really broken English and told us the story. She had a do just one daughter, and when she gave birth to her daughter, she had the most amazing orgasm, and we had to check with her. And she said, "No, an orgasm." <laughs> so in the end. <laughs> Childbirth won't be painful at all. In fact, it will be quite a pleasure. You understand? It's due to emotional injuries, the intergender emotional injuries, that these pains occur. When you release them, they will no longer be in your body and therefore your body will be able to adjust to everything that's going on inside of it. And so you actually, believe it or not, also have control over conception. The male and the female both have control over conception without you needing to choose any contraceptive method medically. Obviously, that again is going to be something that will happen when you're in the oneness state. So, 
our desire in the end is going to be matched by our ability to control our own body and our ability to determine when we want to be pregnant or not and when you want to menstruate or not. So why uh, it's due to the intergender, inter, the, the, the transgenerational, intergender emotional injuries that are carried by the world today that are imposed upon every subsequent generation. So if we as a generation get rid of those intergender injuries, it's going to have a powerful effect medically and emotionally and physically on every single person that comes after us. Yeah, can I say on the subject of like period pain, I have found really, um, I've always suffered very bad period pain and um, since I started on the Divine Love Path, I've noticed uh, um, how many emotions are actually linked to that about myself as a woman and I feel like it is a really multi-generational thing that we carry. So um, I threw out the Nakasen. And I just feel my emotions. <laughs> so, so now what Mary's been doing is uh, not taking the painkillers, obviously, and allowing herself to feel the emotions. And it's quite amazing sometimes. She doesn't even sometimes have to feel the emotion. Like, just to identify what the emotion is and it subsides. Yeah. So I've, I've actually processed quite a bit of emotion around my identity as a woman and shame and all in that period of time. Sorry? Same goes, Same goes for menopause, by the way. Right? Yeah, that's right. Your symptoms will eventually go as you grow in divine love and as you work through the emotions. Symptoms of menopause will disappear completely in the end and you won't actually have menopause in the end. You'll be able to procreate at any age and, and it will be your own choice. Have you just crossed your legs? <laughs> <laughs> So some of you will be 100 year old in the future, having a baby. Oh no. But you won't look 100, you'll look 25. You'll feel fantastic. And you'll feel fantastic. Joshua, thanks. Um, you said before you guys were the first uh, soul to unite, is that right? To? To unite. Yeah, the 20 seconds for your site, yes. Does that mean that, um, like, is, like, surely in, in the, the timeline of infinity, is, is there other Earths with different spirit world, like, levels going on? Or is it, like, how can you be the first? Um, I'm only saying from this Earth. Yeah, so there's a spirit, like, stepping thing happening. Yeah, well, when, Earth. when you're in the 20 seconds for your state, you can answer all of those questions. And when I'm back in the 20 seconds of your state, I'll answer all those questions for you. But at the moment, because I'm not in that state again, I can't answer those questions. All I can do is answer based on what I feel is true. And I feel there are other Earths where there is life. I'm not sure whether there is human life yet on those other planets. Because I have a strong feeling, actually, that, that the Earth was sort of like one of the first places that God created this system. And so... We may find at some point in the future that while these other planets exist and they have other forms of life on them, that actual human life might be part of our own process of actually reaching the 20 seconds for state and having children. Because the soul at that state can have children. So in other words, children at the soul level. So we're talking like God has children. Do you follow me? So, so yeah, I, w I wouldn't say we'd be gods, but but, you know, we'll be the parents, if you like, of those, of those children. And just to be young, like, I'm really curious about UFOs, aliens. Yep. That's such a huge phenomenon. Can we ask that in another, another no, session? I was just going to ask, is there going to be a day when you do that? Um, it'll probably be involved with lots of just general questions. So we might have a general question day where people like many of you probably now have lots of just general questions, not particularly on a subject. Now we might make a day where there's just a general question day and bring it off then. That'd be great. Thanks. Hey Jan, Mary. Um, I'm curious about the point of conception. I've seen a DVD about 10 years ago when I saw um, 
Yes, the ovum certainly does choose the sperm, but it's based again on the emotions that are in the mother and the emotions that are in the father at the time of the sex act. So it's, it's all to do with actually the emotions causing the entire... In fact, your entire physical body is totally driven by your emotional system. So your soul even controls how fast you age, all of the replication of all the cells inside of you, including the cells that are to do with the sexual union. So all of those cells are under the control of the soul. So yes, they do select. The key is knowing how to make that selection on a conscious level, which only occurs when you're again at one with the father. And when I say on a conscious level, it happens so rapidly that you don't, it just is based around your emotional condition. Does that make sense? It's like, it is based around the emotional condition. Yeah, well, I guess AJ, you know, what, what I can say many years ago, I like to listen to the subject conscious, obviously. Yeah. Um, and the other question I had when Mary was talking about the periods and honouring, you know, in my generation, we all grew up with our periods basically being called curse. <coughs> we called our periods the curse. curse yep. And so our imprinting from many generations has been to totally dishonour our sexuality and ourselves as women. Totally. Yes, in the next sex and sexuality discussion that we have, we'll talk more about the practical things you can do to heal different aspects of sexuality and also heal different areas of your body, which, you know, that, that certainly will be a big part of that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. James, thank you, and then... I, I chose to have a vasectomy about 25 years ago and thinking back on that now I'm very aware that it was made on the basis of emotional injury yep. and I'm also aware that that's, I feel that that's had quite an impact, it certainly had an impact on testicular function yep. and it's had an impact on me as a person and uh, I know that I really have to address that emotional injury but I'm wondering whether that, that, as I address that, whether that changes sexual function or whether I should think about reversal of the vasectomy. And I've had the same thing happen, so I've uh, had a vasectomy too. Um, and my, so my comments apply to myself as much as yourself. As you work through your emotional injuries, your vasectomy will be automatically restored. And you, when you get into a point of abundance with God, all of your physical body problems will be, you can heal yourself anyway. So the vasectomy itself will be healed. It certainly does impair the function, but it impairs the function more from the emotional condition than from the actual act of having the vasectomy. So, it's all, so that's why it's immeasurable from a doctor's perspective, because the emotions were present before you had the vasectomy anyway. So it's the same emotions again. So it's dealing with the emotions that cause you to want to do that that need to be released and worked through. And once they're worked through, your body has the ability to heal that part of your body anyway. Yeah. Again, it's something I've had to pray about. We've got about uh, repentance, about also looking at the issue of modifying my body for the sake of my own emotions. And uh, it's the same kind of thing that a woman would go through with many different things with regard to breast implants and other things like that too. You go through these kind of emotions of modifying your body. The truth actually is, ladies, that as you deal with the emotions inside of you, your breast will get to what is their designed size, if you like. All right. And if your breasts are far too large, it's it's usually because of over nurturing emotions. If your breasts are undersized, it's due to generally under nurturing types of emotions. And as you work through those intergender type emotions, you'll find that your body shape will change. So. 
don't go out and buy a whole new wardrobe now. <laughs> no, of course you can buy them anywhere you want. <laughs> I was just going to say too that in my first marriage I, I pressured my wife into having a tubal ligation. Yep. And that's another. And hence the guilt about the vasectomy. Yeah, yeah. So it was the guilt driving the vasectomy. Mm -hmm. 